the year 2000, Nintendo was preparing some massive announcements at their annual trade show, Nintendo Space World. The first reveal, their next big home console, the Nintendo GameCube. The other announcement, the Game Boy Advance. With these new consoles came the latest entries to classic Nintendo franchises like Super Mario, Metroid, and of course, The Legend of Zelda. Fans eagerly awaited the next big follow-up to the highly popular 3D Zelda titles Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, so Shigeru Miyamoto himself would introduce a demo for the future of the Zelda franchise. <laughs> IGN at this time described this trailer as, quote, absolutely everything we could have hoped for in a GameCube Zelda title, end quote, lauding Link's character model for its flowing hair and expressive features. The crowd at the event cheered, and I'm sure there were tears of nerdy joy flowing from the eyes of that audience. The next evolution of Zelda was on its way. Many months later. <laughs> So Zelda fans may adore the Wind Waker now, but back in this time, this is one of the most controversial decisions that Nintendo has made for this franchise, like ever. Even Miyamoto was a little on the fence about this new cartoony cell shaded version of Link. So let's do some digging to uncover how this change occurred and discuss the major title featuring this design. But first, let's start with its debut game, The Legend of Zelda, The Four Swords. Wait, Mentok, what do you mean? What about the Wind Waker? How could you? Okay, so we'll save the Four Swords games for a follow-up video, but it's true that Four Swords is technically the debut game for Toon Link. On December 2nd, 2002, Nintendo, in collaboration with Capcom, released The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past and Four Swords in North America for the Game Boy Advance. A significant chunk of this game was a modified port of A Link to the Past, which I have a video on for your binging pleasure. But the other part, Four Swords, was a strictly multiplayer game with a brand new story featuring Toon Link for the first time. While The Wind Waker is already in development and influenced the art direction for Four Swords, the latter marked the debut of this art style for Link. Interestingly enough, Japanese audiences wouldn't get Four Swords until March 2003, but received The Wind Waker in December 2002, while US audiences had to wait until March 2003 for The Wind Waker. Even with these dates in mind, Four Swords came first, but we'll save that discussion for a dedicated Four Swords video. Now, let's dive into the gorgeous world of the Wind Waker. Our story begins with the legend of a Hyrule long past. An evil man spread chaos through the land with the power of the Triforce, but a young hero dressed in a green tunic stepped up to oppose him and managed to seal him away, bringing peace to the land. This hero would be known as the Hero of Time, and became a legend across generations. But one day that sealed evil broke out and brought terror to the land again, and this time, a hero didn't appear. The situation is dire, so the kingdom could only do one thing, pray to the gods for help. Many, many years have passed, and no one knows the fate of this mysterious land of Hyrule, but its story persists, with one island named Outset Island starting a tradition of giving a green tunic to young boys who come of age. And that's where we meet our hero, Link. <laughs> But before we officially see how he plays into this tale, this whole opening story is meant to recap the events of Ocarina of Time. And since Princess Zelda sent that Link back in time to live out the rest of his childhood after they sealed away Ganon, the spirit of the hero is completely missing from this particular timeline. No hero incarnations or reincarnations to save the day, hence that dire situation at the end of the legend. So Hyrule as we know it is all but lost, which brings us back to our new Link. It's time for his coming of age, which means he gets his own green tunic in honor of the Hero of Time. On this island, Link lives alongside his grandmother and younger sister, Errol, who permits him to use her telescope as a coming of age gift. And that's when Link spots trouble. A giant bird known as the Helmarok King is flying over the island with a girl trapped in his talons. But a nearby pirate ship fires a well-placed cannonball, saving the girl from its clutches. Link discovers her name is Tetra, captain of the same set of pirates. But introductions are short because the Helmarok King does another pass on the island and grabs Errol instead, whisking her off to the foreboding, forsaken fortress. So in hopes to find his sister, it's time for Link to temporarily become a pirate and join Tetra's crew on a rescue mission. As they approach the fortress, it's time to quietly get inside.
great plan. This is where the player will get their feet wet, as Link has to brave the depths of the fortress in an attempt to get to his sister. But once he finds her, their reunion is pretty brief. Helmarok King grabs Link and shows him off to his master, and I wonder who this could be. It's obviously Ganondorf, but more on him later. By his command, the bird throws Link to his death in the ocean, but Link is made of steel apparently and survives this fall. He's rescued by none other than a talking boat, who calls himself the King of Red Lions. So Boat here explains to Link that somehow Ganondorf, the breaker of seals, broke a seal placed on him by the gods, and now he once again seeks to cause mayhem on the land. And the only way to stop him? Using the power of the legendary Master Sword, a sword that can only be accessed by overcoming trials. So I'm sure you all see where this is going. So Link must go on a journey to find three goddess pearls to prove himself worthy of wielding the Master Sword. But first, our boat friend here gifts Link with a powerful artifact used to control the winds. The Wind Waker. Hey, that's the name of the game! And with that, the mission is set. The world opens up for the player to explore, with the King of the Red Lions joining Link as his mode of transportation. The player will discover pretty quickly that a majority of this world consists of a great sea, and with the freedom to sail wherever he pleases, Link will jump from island to island in search of the Goddess Pearls. And the first stop is Dragon Roost Island, where the Rito tribe resides, a bird-like species who doubles as the world's post officers since they just fly everywhere instead. If you're familiar with the Zelda series, a fun fact about this tribe is that they evolved from the Zora species that were prominent in Hyrule during Ocarina of Time. A species known for being aquatic are now rocking beaks and feathers. So on Dragon Roost Island, Link goes around helping the Rito tribe with their local problems, the main one being their sky spirit Valu being out of control on top of a nearby mountain. And since this young Rito named Prince Kamali is holding on to Din's Pearl, the goddess pearl Link needs, it's time to do a favor for a favor. So with the help of another Rito named Medley, Link scales the mountain to figure out what's going on. Of course, there's more to this story. A giant spider named Goma is behind everything. And behind everything, I mean Valu. Like he's literally underneath him biting his butt all day. That's what's happening here. But not to worry. Link murders it and this makes Valu chill out. And just as planned, Prince Komali relinquishes his goddess Pearl in exchange. So that's one Pearl down, two to go. This adventure is going to be a breeze. No, it's not. The next stop for Link and Boat is Forest Haven, where he'll meet the Koroks and the Great Deku Tree. If this dynamic seems somewhat familiar to you, yes, this is another callback to Ocarina of Time, with the Koroks being the evolution of the Kokiri tribe of the forest, their home being where the Hero of Time grew up. Personally, I think they got the evolutionary short end of the stick here. But Link is in luck, because the Great Deku Tree and the Koroks are ready to just hand over Ferrari's Pearl. But as Zelda games have taught us, it's not that easy. A Korok named Makar is lost in the Forbidden Woods, a dangerous island covered with monsters. Sounds exactly like the place we want to go. Another favor for a favor. So Link jumps in to rescue Makar from the island, where he squares off with the next major boss. Wait till you see the. <laughs> Kal Demos? Kale Demos? Kaye Demos? Dale. Kale Demos. Pick your favorite pronunciation. But by defeating this boss, Link rescues Makar. And with their problem solved, the Great Deku Tree and the Koroks reward Link with Ferrari's Pearl. So that's two pearls down, one to go. We're almost there. The final pearl, Nehru's Pearl, is located on Great Fish Isle, where Link must obtain it from the water spirit Jabun. Yet another callback to Ocarina of Time, where it's theorized that Jabun is a descendant of Lord Jabu Jabu, the giant whale creature that the Hero of Time hopped inside of to find Princess Ruto of the Zora that one time. So in their search for Jabun, Link and the King of Red Lions find the island to be ransacked and Jabun is missing. It turns out he's hiding in a cave near Outset Island in an attempt to stay safe from Ganondorf. After going on a bit of a side mission, aka stealing bombs from Tetra's pirate crew, Link manages to blow up the entrance blocking entry into Jabun's hideaway, and speaks to the water spirit who agrees to give him Nehru's pearl. Okay, so surely after all of this, Link is worthy of wielding this master sword, right? No, it's not. Link has to place the pearls in their rightful locations at the Triangle Islands, which reveals the Tower of the Gods, which rises from the Great Sea. Then he has to get to the top of this tower, defeat Godon, the guardian of the tower, which must mean he's now worthy of the sword, right? Okay, so defeating Godon then gives Link roof access to the tower, but unfortunately there's no party up here. It's a giant bell that he has to ring, which reveals a portal in the ocean near the tower. And finally, when he heads to the portal, Link and the King of Red Lions go beneath the waves to a castle that's suspended in time. <gasps> Is this Hyrule Hyrule? More on that later. But here within this castle, Link finally discovers the one and only Master Sword. And in this satisfying cutscene, he removes it from its pedestal.
So after doing this, time begins to flow in Hyrule once again, but no time to worry about that now. We have to go vanquish Ganon and become a self-made hero. But let's pause here for a second. I got so caught up in this story, I didn't even mention how this Link came to be in the first place. We have to rewind back to the year 2000. Production on GameCube titles were ramping up and for the next big Zelda title, Eiji Awanuma would step up to direct. You may know him now for being the head producer for the Zelda franchise. So after his work on Majora's Mask, early concepts began for the next title following up on the foundation established by Ocarina of Time. With veteran producers and creators of the series Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka jumping in as the producers. So in this extremely early phase, there wasn't much of a game to even present at Space World 2000. So Aonuma and the team quickly put together the clip of Link and Ganondorf to build up hype for the GameCube reveal. And while this completely wowed the fans, Aonuma disliked it. Even though it had enhanced graphics, he found the style to be too samey to pass Zelda games. It was difficult for us to imagine ourselves easily coming up with new ideas and expanding on that world if we've chosen that path. Of course, while a game is more than its visuals, it's going to be made mostly by the same people, and the ideas we had within the same team had its limits. So he and the team explored other options. Enter designers Yoshiki Haruhana and Satoru Takizawa. First, Haruhana conceptualized a more cartoonish version of a younger Link that turned heads within the team, with Takizawa thinking, quote, The instant I saw that drawing, my designer spirit came to life, and I thought, with a character like that, we can give him actions that will look and feel good no matter how he moves. With this in mind, Takizawa sketched Moblin designs in a similar style. The two designs gave the team an aha moment, and they decided to push forward with a more cartoon aesthetic for their new title, building on a cel-shaded technique to achieve this for 3D models. And so, Toon Link was born. Cell shading is a technique that uses a shading algorithm on 3D models to make it look more flat and cartoony. And we see this technique all the time in the current gaming era, more frequently with games based on anime to preserve the look of 2D animation in some form. But in the year 2000 for gaming, this technique was pretty new. Fear Effect, released in February 2000 for the PlayStation, would be one of the earliest examples of cell shading being applied to 3D models. These models were put against pre-rendered backgrounds, so not fully cell shaded but I'd argue this game visually was way ahead of its time, especially having pulled this off on the PlayStation. But it was Jet Set Radio, released in June 2000 for the Sega Dreamcast, that truly pioneered how far this technique could go in video games. To this day, Jet Set Radio's aesthetic is wildly praised and opened the floodgates for more games using this technique in the sixth generation of consoles. I'm not saying Sega directly influenced Aonuma's team or their direction to go with cell shaded graphics, but visually this style was definitely starting to become more popular. And this would show in games that followed shortly after, like Okami and Beautiful Joe. So with Aonuma and the rest of the Zelda team going full force with the cartoon style, they used a custom engine for their new title, as well as one of the most popular 3D tools at the time, Maya. And to further complement the cartoonish visuals, they decided the game would take place among islands in a large ocean, and it wouldn't be long before sailing would be established as a major mechanic in-game. With development proceeding quickly, it was time for Anuma to present the new project to Miyamoto and Tezuka, and after seeing the drastic change in graphical style, it's an understatement to say that they had concerns. One of these concerns was asking the team to supply a reason for Link's eyes being so big. Their answer? Having laser beams come out of them. While I think this was meant to be more of a playful idea, Link's expressive design is not just for show. If the player stands still, Link's eyes will shift around looking in the directions of secrets, items, or the path to progress giving the player a subtle hint of what to do next. Despite the team's enthusiasm for their new Zelda title, Miyamoto continued to question Aonuma on whether this was the best route. However, seeing the team's excitement and commitment, Miyamoto eventually supported the decision. And as Space World 2001 approached, it was time to showcase the new direction to the fans. The reaction was mixed, with many fans feeling torn about the cartoonish look of their beloved franchise. Much like Miyamoto, this new direction took time for the fans to get used to. They were divided on the new look, with many believing that the dark, mature vibe initially seen the year before was lost and replaced with a game for kids. Keep in mind, 2001 was a time where grittier games were on the rise, alongside this bump in graphical power, like Halo Combat Evolved, Grand Theft Auto 3, Metal Gear Solid 2, Final Fantasy X, Devil May Cry, and Silent Hill 2. Even Sonic Adventure 2 at that time went with a darker plot, introducing Shadow and his tragic backstory. So you can imagine the type of fans this decision to go with a cartoony style for Zelda may have upset. 
Even Miyamoto, who initially wasn't on board with the drastic change, was surprised by some of the backlash and made a decision to cut back on revealing new information about the title until there was a playable demo that could land in the hands of fans in hope that gameplay would change their minds. And he was right. When they brought the title back to E3 2002 the following year, journalists praised the gameplay and how well it flowed with the new graphical style. Though, as I'm sure you all know, fans of certain franchises can be fickle. So the discourse continued, resorting to dubbing the game Zelda derogatorily. I wonder if anyone watching right now is like one of those skeptical fans from back in the day. If you are, leave a comment. I'm not going to trash you or anything. I'm just curious to know what you thought in that moment in time. At the time, we couldn't really directly see the response online the way we can now. There was already a division between those who liked that artistic style and who didn't. And I had the impression after release that we hadn't quite gotten across that barrier in order to deliver the Zelda game that we wanted. That was just my own vague idea after talking to a number of people." End quote. By October 2002, the title was finally given a name in Japan, Kaze no Takto, or Wind Baton, which would be localized to the Wind Waker in the West to draw attention to the importance of wind within the game. The gameplay for movement and combat remains relatively the same, with Link getting access to a sword and shield pretty early on in the game. The usual gameplay loop of Link meeting unique characters with colorful personalities and helping them with their troubles for rewards in exchange is still a major part of the game as well. There are seven major dungeons Link will explore to achieve his goal of taking down Ganon, and along the way he'll discover equipment that veteran Zelda players will recognize, like bombs, the hookshot, the boomerang, etc. Even the Wind Waker mechanics themselves, while a bit more, shall I say, complex, are heavily based on the Ocarina of Time from the previous titles, with Link being able to play six different songs that affect the world around him, allowing Link to change the direction of the wind or the time of day or even warp across the map. But what truly sets this game apart from the Zelda games that came before is the sailing. If you played this game, this was pretty groundbreaking and I'm sure this is probably one of the main things you remember about it. Link utilizes a sail attached to the King of Red Lions and must utilize the direction of the wind to control their speed, which means using the Wind Waker to alter the wind's flow is going to be crucial and something the player does frequently. This is the sight you're going to be seeing a majority of the time in the Wind Waker. And while I have no qualms with the sailing mechanic or the majesty of this cell shaded ocean and the wind and waves subtly breathing life into this environment, it can get very tedious. The Great Sea contains 49 unique islands of different sizes. This includes the islands with towns, dungeons, and uninhabited ones, which really makes this, I believe, one of the most unique worlds in the Zelda franchise. There's just a lot of water here, and you're going to be navigating the sea very often. No shit. Sometimes this can be a vibe, just a very therapeutic piece of gaming as the two sail the Great Sea together. Maybe you don't use the map and just pick a direction and head there to see what awaits on those mysterious islands in the distance. Or maybe you just want to power through the game and want to do as little sailing as possible. Either way, there's no avoiding it, you're going to have to be sailing a lot. And that's not to say nothing happens on the Great Sea, you may find treasure that can be pulled up to your boat using the grappling hook or you may stumble upon an enemy base that has goodies awaiting inside once you murder every last one of them. The choice is yours. Link will also obtain these treasure maps throughout the game, which you'll have to use to navigate to collect items that are buried under this vast sea. All of these brand new elements that we see blossom within the Wind Waker, I think served as an important rubric for further evolving the open world design in future Zelda titles, especially comparing it to Breath of the Wild. For instance, the sailing feature opens up a non-linear world for Link, allowing him to tackle objectives in any order, or interacting with the environment using the Wind Waker to influence the wind's direction, or just the overall emphasis of discovery and exploration. These are elements that are the cornerstone of current 3D Zelda titles, and I can only long for Nintendo to take another pass at the Great Sea, using what they know now to fill it with a ton of new and interesting islands with towns, mini dungeons, and treasure to make sailing even more rewarding. But I digress. Before we go check up on Link, there was one other interesting addition to this game that I don't hear many people in the wild reminisce about, and that's the Tingle Tuner. Our other favorite Zelda character in green makes a return in the Wind Waker, and it has me thinking that maybe he deserves his own video, because I can't remember if I even brought him up in the Majora's Mask and Oracle of Ages videos. Link will stumble upon Tingle on Windfall Island, in jail no less. He's being detained under the accusation that he stole an item called a Picto Box, or this game's version of the camera. So if Link helps Tingle bust out, Tingle will reward him with the Tingle Tuner, an item that allows the player to take their Wind Waker experience onto their Game Boy Advance. Yes, the Tingle Tuner was Nintendo's way of capitalizing the Link feature between the GameCube and Game Boy Advance. 
So to access this feature, you would have to plug the Game Boy Advance into the controller socket for the GameCube and then activate the Tingle Tuner, which will allow Link to summon Tingle. And this was intended to support two-player cooperative play, so while one player explored the world of Wind Waker, another player would use the Game Boy Advance to provide support. The Game Boy screen displayed its own version of the map, with Tingle serving as a guide. And not only can Tingle give additional insights to Link's location or uncover secrets not seen on the main screen, Tingle also had a shop stocked with special items that could be purchased using rupees. And then these items could be used to assist Link, like the Tingle Bomb, special bombs used to reveal treasure on the GBA screen. You can also buy Tings, Tingle's brand of soda that can be used to restore different gauges for Link. So Tingle has amazing flavors here like Red Ting, Green Ting, and Blue Ting to quench Link's thirst after being on the sea for so long. Being of Jamaican heritage, I appreciate this naming convention and also shout out to the real Ting out there, which is an actual soda. It's phenomenal. Tangent aside, I guess Nintendo found Tingle to be so popular in Japan, he got three of his own spin-off titles. So let me know if I should even go down that rabbit hole at some point. Anyway, let's head back to the story and see how Link is doing. Oh good, he's ready to face Ganondorf once again with his brand new Master Sword in his possession. Despite defeating the Helmarok King and working together with Tetra's crew to save Errol, Ganondorf wipes the floor with Link. The Master Sword is not enough, and by retrieving the sword, Link also unsealed the rest of Ganondorf's power. Tetra attempts to help, but is Mollywop too, but... <gasps> plot twist! By being so close to Ganondorf, he identifies Tetra as Princess Zelda. Unbeknownst to her, of course, and the necklace she's had this whole time was a piece of the Triforce of Wisdom all along. Luckily, before Ganon can do any more damage, Prince Kamali and Valu come to the rescue, getting them out of dodge before attempting to incinerate Ganon in his tower. As everyone escapes to Hyrule, the King of Red Lions finally reveals the truth to Link and Tetra. He is the last king of the Lost Kingdom of Hyrule, and in this cutscene, we finally learn the truth. Apparently, after no hero popped up to save the day when Ganon returned all those years ago, they prayed to the goddesses, who decided to just flood the whole place and start over. They did warn the good people of the land to retreat to the mountaintops, which, after their flood, became the islands that Link has been traveling to this whole time. The king, Daphnis Nohansen Hyrule, stayed behind with his kingdom, holding on to one piece of the Triforce of Wisdom while his daughter, the Princess Zelda of his time, went on to live her life in the New World after the flood. Tetra is a descendant of that Zelda, who passed along her piece of the Triforce for generations. With the fragments finally reunited and all the truths revealed, the Master Sword needs to be reawakened to stop Ganon. To do so, sages are needed to keep the Master Sword's power flowing, but unfortunately, Ganon murdered two of them. So first order of business for Link, find some new ones. Fortunately for him, he has friends that are able to take up the mantle, with Makar awakening as the new Sage of Wind, and Medley awakening as the new Sage of Earth. This allows them to restore the Master Sword to its former glory, but this alone wasn't enough. That brings us to Link's second order of business, restore the Triforce of Courage the shattered fragment of the Triforce left behind by the Hero of Time so long ago. This is the part of the game that requires you to be a little bit more adventurous. You'll need these special maps located across the Great Sea called Triforce Charts that can be deciphered by Tingle at a cost to reveal the location of the Triforce Shard. There are a total of 8 Triforce Charts in all, and the game encourages you to start looking for these shards before you get to this moment, pushing you to start exploring islands on the Great Sea, so this quest may not be too tedious if you're going off the beaten path during your journey. If you haven't been doing that whatsoever and waited until the end game, then it's time to strap in and get to sailing. Oh, and if you want Tingle to decipher all these charts for you, it's going to come up to a whopping 3,184 rupees, so I hope you've been saving up. For those of you who've played this game, how many of you waited to the last minute to collect these shards? I'm just curious. Interestingly enough, this portion of the game wasn't the original vision the devs had in mind leading up to the final battle with Ganondorf. There were two dungeons that were initially planned but had to be cut due to time constraints and instead, they scattered Triforce pieces around the Great Sea to compensate. Most speculate that one of these dungeons was meant for obtaining Nehru's Pearl from Jabun, who just hands it to you once you meet him despite having to clear dungeons and beat bosses to obtain the other two. Also, only two sages were required to restore the Master Sword. I mean, in the past, there's always been like seven sages, so it's clear that maybe at least one more may have been missing here. But my first thought after hearing all this is, why not include those dungeons in the Wind Waker HD remake for the Wii U released back in 2013, which is 11 years old now, Jesus Christ. Turns out those cut dungeons ended up being used in future titles, though it hasn't been specifically revealed which ones. It's probably a no-brainer to say Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword, but maybe Aonuma will release more details on this in the future. 
There's a safe speculation that the underwater Hyrule was meant to be its own separate world that Link would be able to explore in the later half of the game. With this concept art showing a potential mechanic of Link tugging on a fish hook from beneath the water to have someone yank him up from the lower world back to the surface. Not only that, the concept art published in the Hyrule Historia reference book shows that they dabbled in the idea of Link aging throughout the game, which highly suggests an older Link would have been featured in the second half of the story, similarly to Ocarina of Time. Personally, I love the idea of them experimenting with this in a future Zelda game where the adventure is so vast that the years just gradually start piling on Link and he progressively gets older with time. But we return to our story, and Link collects all of the shards and restores the Triforce of Courage. After all the trials and busy work he's gone through, it's time to get validation from the gods. So he takes the Triforce back to the Tower of the Gods where they acknowledge him as a new hero. Finally, someone to fill the shoes of the Hero of Time. And with that, Toon Link here is dubbed the Hero of Winds. So proud of you, man. But before they can celebrate with Tetra Zelda down in Hyrule, they discover she's been kidnapped by Ganondorf and taken to his tower. Some old habits die hard, I guess. But Link is over this adventure by now, so he scales the tower to finish off Ganondorf once and for all. The Link squares off with a puppet version of Ganondorf, but at this point, Ganon has also had enough. And by using Link and Zelda, he recreates the full Triforce using their pieces and uh-oh, it's too late. He makes a wish for Hyrule to resurface so he can take it for himself once and for all. At this point in the game, it's almost sad to see him so stuck in the past trying to relive his glory days. Ganon is like that one friend that sticks around a house party once it's done and doesn't know when to leave. Julian. Anyway, the Triforce decides to ignore Ganondorf's wish because the king snuck up and touched the Triforce before Ganon did, making his wish first for a pair of women's underwear. Wrong story. His actual wish is to bury himself and Ganondorf beneath the waves of the Great Sea, putting an end to old relics of a time long past. The Triforce grants this wish and begins to flood Hyrule again, but Ganondorf cannot let go and tries to kill off Link, which leads to a final battle. Once victorious, Link ends this in the coldest way possible, by lodging the Master Sword straight through Ganondorf's forehead. It's finally over. With one last goodbye to the old king of Hyrule, Link and Zelda return to the surface and become pirates. Yo! And together they head off on an adventure to find a new land to explore. The end. Or is it? We'll talk about those some other time. But there's one more feature the player can access once this game is complete. Second quest. You get to play the whole game again in Link's pajamas. On release, The Wind Waker received glowing reviews, with the game currently sitting at a 96 out of 100 on Metacritic. Many critics thoroughly enjoyed the game's visuals, comparing it to playing a cartoon and even pushed back against the backlash from fans. It'd be nominated for several Game of the Year awards, praised for its storytelling, music, and design. And ultimately, The Wind Waker was a commercial success, pushing around 4.6 billion copies worldwide, making it the fourth best-selling GameCube game of all time. Despite what seems like an impressive number, this was disappointing for Nintendo. In comparison, Ocarina of Time had sold 7.6 million copies, so when they looked at the slow sales for The Wind Waker, they attributed this to the North American audience wanting something more realistic. This would lead to the development of the darker, more mature Twilight Princess. As for Japanese audiences, The Wind Waker was more warmly received, but at this time, there was an overall decline in the video game market, so that was yet another challenge Nintendo had to face. But the good news here is that eventually the Zelda community came around to respect The Wind Waker, as it's now looked back on as one of the most creative and charming titles in the franchise. And because of its cell shaded approach, it's aged pretty well. I mentioned the HD remake for the Wii U released in 2013, which if you think about it, more time has passed between the release of the remake and present day than the time between the original release and the HD remake. I feel old. But this remake is a gorgeous revamping of Wind Waker, which includes widescreen support, improved lighting, and this selfie mode on the Picto Box item that opened the door to some hilarious screenshots. The audio was given a facelift as well using higher quality instruments, and the interface as a whole was updated to make frequently used items like the Wind Waker more accessible to players. The remake also added an item known as the Swift Sail, which would allow Link to sail even faster due to the higher technical power of the Wii U. The quest for the Triforce Shards was significantly trimmed down in this version as well. Now the player can find 5 of the 8 shards without having to decipher Triforce charts, which also puts less strain on Link's wallet. 
But without the Game Boy Advance support, the Tingle Tuner was changed to the Tingle Bottle, an item that allowed players to send messages to other players of the game through Miiverse, Nintendo's social network for the Wii U, which I miss terribly. The players could leave messages and screenshots within the bottle and then toss it into the ocean to be collected by another player. But since the Miiverse has been discontinued, this item is now useless if you have this version of the game. But that's not even everything. There are quite a few other quality of life changes that I think could take up a whole video in itself. But just know this wasn't a cash grab remaster. Let me know in the comments which version you guys played first. But I know there are purists out there who always recommend playing the original version of games like these on the original console, but there are so many quality of life and graphical changes to the remake that I think it's worth your time to hunt down a copy and try it out. So if you're one of the people that held on to your Wii U like me, look at all that dust on it, you can scoop up this game for a pretty low low cost of $112, Nintendo. Please re-release this game.